All right. Well, it seems that we're ready to start. Welcome to the uh, ICSI 2022 award session. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, be the chair of this session and start by recognizing our fearless leaders. Uh, Matthew Dwyer, our general chair, Daniel Damien, and Andrea Zeller, our program chairs, and uh, a special shout to uh, Oscar Dieste, Claudia Ayala, and Fabio Petrillo, who are uh, really working hard behind the scenes to make sure that this virtual program works as smoothly as it's working. Um, so if this was the physical, uh, you know, an in-person meeting, we would have them all step up to the podium, give them hugs and flowers and congratulations and a big uh, plaque or a, a plaque. Um, but in the absence of that, I hope uh, you're all, you know, thanking them and, and uh, showing your, your appreciation through uh, any means that you can. Uh, they are really uh, have put a, an amazing number of hours to make this event happen. Uh, these basically two conferences, one in virtual and one in person, happen during the month of May. Just a tremendous effort. And these are the most visible faces, but they're also, uh, I, I don't know even how to count it, but if you just count all the people involved, the student volunteers, the people in all the committees and the organizations, our community has invested hours from 500, over 500 volunteers to make this conference happen. So uh, a big thank you to all of you. This is not an award, but really a recognition and the reason to be happy that our, our community is so committed to its development and its growth. So with that, um, I would like to move on and let the program uh, co-chair, uh, Dana, uh, lead the awards uh, of the DPA papers. Go ahead. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, I think we can be talking for many, many days and weeks about the great collaborative effort in organizing the conference. And we built tremendous memories uh, that will stay with us for a long time. Today, I'd like to recognize the authors who wrote exceptional papers in our technical track and the reviewers who, mel to, 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 who carried our process so diligently so that these papers get to be presented and, and recognized today as well. As I said yesterday, uh, uh, ICSI reviewing has become an, a, a colossal task in an effort to be very inclusive and uh, leverage expertise uh, of our community in different parts of the world. We had close to 200 program committee members, uh, and there's no way I can name them all. But and they all beca we became very intimate uh, across a three months review process between September and November and end of November last year um, through a many rounds of reviews and discussions. Uh, we had author responses providing information and then we went back to, to the discussion table. And these people have considered uh, the papers very carefully, others reviewers, they discussed it to be authors responsive to consideration very diligently. And I have to say that, you know, they each had 12, 13 reviews, papers to, to discuss and agree on within this time. Um, on top of their normal lives, we teach, uh, we have ch young children, some, some of us, we have elderly to take care of, <clears throat> and many other commitments, and sometimes hardships. Um, you know, we had tragedies in, in, in people's families. They had to, to, to take a break for a few weeks and then come back and pick up the pieces. And I wanted to recognize all of them uh, who, who, who maintained their interest and dedication to the review process so that we actually ended up with the high quality reviews. But some of them uh, went the extra mile and we'd like to provide special distinguished reviewer awards. Um, so sorry, paper, paper awards. Um, I'd like to start with, um, and then I'll get to the, to the reviewer awards. We announced the nominations of the um, uh, for, from our pr program. We had 19 papers. These are um, shown with the badge in the program, and they started uh, being presented yesterday. I'm hoping that everyone is interested in listening to their presentations. Um, but we had nine, which <clears throat> were considered as, as, as a word winning um, quality by their program, com the, the reviewers. And then Andreas and I, we investigated their, their, their reviews and the discussion thoroughly, and we uh, agreed to award nine Distinguished Paper Awards. The first one is uh, for the paper called PUS, a fast and highly efficient solver for inclusion-based pointer analysis by Pei Ming Liu, Yan Zeli, Bradley Swain, and Jeff Wang from Texas 
A&M University. Congratulations. The second one is, did you miss my comment or what? Understanding toxicity in open source discussions by Courtney Miller, Sophie Cohen, Daniel Klug, Dan Bogdan Vasilescu and Christian Kessner from Carnegie Mellon University and Wesleyan University. I apologize in advance if I mispronounce uh, names or universities. The third one is entitled, This is Damn Slick, Estimating the Impact of Tweets on Open Source Project Popularity and New contribu Contributors by Hongbo Feng, Herman Lambda, Jim Herbslab, and Bogdan Vasilescu, all from Carnegie Mellon University. The first one is entitled Diversity Driven Automated Formal Verification by Emily First and Yuri Brun, University of Massachusetts Amherst. The fifth one is TOGA, a neural method for test oracle generation by Elizabeth Dinella, Gabriel Ryan, Todd Mitkovich, and Shuvendu Lahiri from University of Pennsylvania, Columbia University, Microsoft Research. The sixth one is Sim Tuner, maximizing the power of symbolic execution by adaptively tuning external parameters by Su Yung Cha. Mi Yung Li, Seo Kyun Li, and Hak Ju O oh from Sung Kyun Kan University in Korea. Seventh paper uh, being awarded is entitled Efficient Online Testing for DNN Enabled Systems Using Surrogate Assisted and Many Objective Optimization by Fitash Ui Hak, Dong Wen Shin, and Lionel Briam from University of Luxembourg and University of Ottawa. The eighth one uh, is entitled, What Makes a Good Commit Message? by Tian Ying Chen, Yu, Yu, Yuja Zheng, Klaas Yan Stoll, Lin Zheng, and Hui Liu from Beijing University of Technology and University College Cork. The last one is Collaboration Challenges in Building Machine Learning Enabled Systems, Communication, Documentation, Engineering, and Process by Nadia Nahar, Shurui Shizhu, Grace Lewis, and Christian Kessner from Carnegie Mellon University and University of Toronto. As I said, uh, we are delighted to offer also the awards of distinguished reviewers to a subset of our program committee members who have went beyond their, their duty to, to um, review and discuss the papers in our program. The first one is Alessio Ferrari for outstanding performance and dedication in reviewing and leading discussions. The second one is Sabrina Marchak from PUKI for outstanding performance in reviewing and leading discussions in difficult times. The third one is Tamara Lopez from Open University for outstanding review work, including exceptionally crafted reviews and meta reviews. I have to say that one of the beautiful part in working with our exceptional committee um, have been learning um, from, from, from the expertise of our reviewers, but also how they presented the information so that it's, it becomes very useful and constructive to the authors and how the arguments are being debated. Um, for the resolution on the paper. <clears throat> Manuel Rieger also receives a uh, Distinguished Reviewer Award for outstanding detail in reviews and reliability as a reviewer. Always there, very um, dedicated and, and prompt. Venera Arnaudova from Washington State University is a word is recognized for outstanding timely reviewing and exemplary and timely performance as discussion lead. Cristina von Flach from Federal University of Bahia in Brazil is recognized for outstanding reviewer work and engagement in difficult times. Alexander Serebrenik from Eindhoven University of Technology is also being awarded for outstanding performance, reliability as a reviewer, consistently clear and thoughtful feedback to authors, and for always being there when asked to do extra reviews. We did have moments when we panicked and we needed an extra pair of eyes to break ties, for example, on some papers. Lastly, but not least, Erwin Kwan, actually we have two more, uh, from MathWorks, 
um, did an exceptional work and consistently outstanding reviews. Uh, he was very reliable as a reviewer and exemplary meta reviews and interacting with authors in response to rebuttals. Christoph Reichenbach from Lund University um, receives an award for outstanding reviewer performance, including the most detailed feedback at ICSI. His, um, uh, his feedback was had over 3,000 words to lucky authors. Jonathan Bell from Northeastern University um, is, uh, is recognized for outstanding reviewer work, but also including the longest discussion for an ICSI 2022 paper with 83 comments. He did not let it go. Uh, here's a summary of our distinguished reviewers. Uh, we thank them all again for, um, for, for being there. We know that ICSI happens because of the work of so many people who, as I said, they're all volunteers and they give us their time and dedication. Uh, I, we do have a couple of uh, special mentions uh, in addition to these, to these awards, and I'm going to go one by one. Uh, Rohan Paddy uh, is recognized for very thoughtful and detailed reviews and for a positive, constructive approach in the discussions. Andre van der Hoek for sustained effort in long online discussions and for writing detailed, unbiased meta reviews, even when the decision was against own perspective. That shows experience and, and really a passion for, for community where um, we go beyond our own biases and we help um, the authors of the paper understand um, constructively uh, the outcome uh, of their work. Um, Yi Xu Xiao for sustained effort in long online discussions. Jim Herbslab, as usual, very encouraging and extensive constructing reviews and meta reviews. Mark Harmon for an exemplary engagement in online discussions. Walid Malej for very detailed reviews. They were thoughtful, comprehensive answers to author rebuttals and a dedicated discuss discussant, or always there and timely, um, um, clarifying and, and, and responding to, to in discussions. Finally, Vincenzo Gervasi for very detailed reviews, prompt and dedicated discuss discussion um, and discussion lead. In his, in, in his on his papers. Jesus Gonzalez Barahona for very detailed reviews. Informed, he was a very informed discussion to move things to, towards decision and for thoughtfully commenting on the author's responses. Thank you again. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with all of you and, um, and, and you should be very proud of the program that we have and we present this week. I turn that back to you, Sebastian, to continue with the words from the other tracks. Thank you, Daniela. And, and, <clears throat> and, and uh, you know, then I recognize the, the main research technical track, and I'm going to cover a few of the others that had their own awards. Uh, first, the software engineering practice track. This is the track of ICSI that brings uh, the practitioners and the researchers together um, to better understand what is happening in the field and how the techniques that, that were developed and the knowledge that we're gathering is being used or, or is needed. Uh, I'm presenting this award on, the, on behalf of Mark Harmon and Heather Miller. They are the chair of, of uh, the Software Engineering in Practice track this year. And the best paper award goes to Bianca Trinke Reich, Ricardo Brito, Marco Gerosa, and Igor Steinmacher for an empirical investigation on the challenges faced by women in the software industry, a case study. And the SCP awards, uh, if you haven't attended that track, they are having uh, a couple of great keynotes as well. So besides the award papers uh, yesterday, uh, they, had, they had Elaine Wayuker, and today I believe they have um, one of our own uh, that is now at Apple. And, and I'll let you look at his name uh, as, a, uh, as a task, as a follow-up. Uh, next, please. Uh, next, we have the NEAR Awards. This is the new um, and emerging research papers uh, the latest uh, that is happening in our field, but perhaps not quite uh, validated. These are mostly the groundbreaking ideas that are still under development. The Best Paper Award uh, given on the behalf of Liliana Pasquale and Christopher Troyd uh, goes to Lina Ochoa, Thomas de Gele, and Jeremy Faletti for BreakBot, analyzing the impact of breaking changes to assist library evolution. 
So we congratulate them for the best paper. And we also congratulate the best reviewers for, for NIR. And the ones that have been recognized are Xinhui Tan and Fabiano Dalpias. Next, please. Now, the best artifacts award artifacts award are you know very well connected to the keynote that we had yesterday. They're all about enabling the community. Yes, and, and please keep keep the applauses coming for for the for the authors and the best reviewers. Um, for the best artifacts award, again connected to the keynote that we had yesterday, that was so wonderful. Uh, the artifacts award are aiming to help us uh, reproduce and share results among the community. And for this year, uh, Yang Kai and Andreas Vogelsang, the, the chairs of the Artifacts Award of the Artifact Track, have recognized four papers. The first one is for Hyunsu Kim, Mukun Rago, Rago Thaman, and Ki Hong Heo for learning probabilistic models for static alarm, analysis alarms. The second uh, best artifact award goes to Daniel Sokolowski, Pascal Weisenberger, and Guido. Salvaneshi for changes the only constant dynamic updates for workloads. The third award was to Quentin, Stephen Art, David Bankley, and Cohen Den Van Gruber for static stack preserving interprocedural slicing of WebAssembly binaries. And the last award for best artifact goes to Alexi Turcote, Michael Shah, Mark Aldridge, and Frank Tate for Dr. Async, identifying and visualizing anti patterns in asynchronous JavaScript. Again, we congratulate the Best Artifacts Award winners. Next, please. And now this now we reach the, the, the final uh, the final award for ICSI related awards this year. And this is a very special award. So we have, you know, every year we have best paper awards, but we also have the MIP award. And the MIP award is the most influential paper award. It is given on behalf of both ACN6 of and IEEE TCSE. And it's, it's really a, a retrospective award. That's why it's so special. You know, we're, we're OK identifying work that is good this year. Um, but it's really hard to predict which ones of, of the papers that are being published are really going to make a, a, a significant difference in the field. Uh, luckily, we have hindsight, and we can look back through the MIP award and really recognize the work that, that made a difference in the last 10 years, that left a mark in the field, either in the theory or in the practice of software engineering. Um, for XC22, if we look back 10 years, the program chairs from 10 years ago are the ones that lead the ident identification of the uh, MIP paper. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, in Zurich, Gail Murphy and Maura Petze were the uh, program chairs of that program, and on behalf of, of them and their committee, uh, I'm, I'm announcing this award. Next. So the MIP paper uh, this year for ICSI 2012, most influential paper, goes to on the naturalness of software. And the authors are Abraham Hindle, Earl Barr, Mark Gable, Zendon Su, and Prem Devambu. So they Earn this award again. If this would be, uh, you know, in person, we would raise up, uh, congratulate them, and uh, give them plaques and hugs. That's not going to happen now, but it will happen at ICSI for the ones, you know, for the ones of them that are there. Uh, we'll 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 give you we'll keep the six feet separation and somehow give you a hug. We'll figure that out. I think Matt is working on the details of how to do that. But uh, our sincere congratulations to these authors for their impactful work. And just one more plug in on Friday, they're going to give a talk right before the closing. They're going to give the, a talk on reflecting on, you know, what was this paper about and how much impact or uh, how much other work has follow up building on it. So congratulations to the authors. Next, a big applause to all the awardees. And I think with that, we finish the award sessions for today. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about the rest of the awards, awards too. Uh, but with that, let's close here. And Dana, it's all yours to introduce the, the keynote for today. I'm excited to, excited to hear that one. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. I wonder if we should wait perhaps a little bit longer, just in case people connect um, for the 1.30 time slot. And 
they would be missing right at the beginning. Maybe just five minutes, you did, if that's okay. I guess we can close camera and come back at and go grab some tea. We're just pausing, just so you know, we're pausing five minutes so that we mm -hmm. can resync with the schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just realized that if people only connect at, um, you know, one thirty UTC, right? You did. You can, if you wanted, share um, so that your first slide gets up and that, or maybe not, because then when I introduce you, um, then you're not shown anymore. So yeah, sharing is not probably not the best. Your, your, your image will show on the side, right? If she shares, uh, the, the faces will show on the left-hand side. However you want to do it. Yeah, I don't see, of course, when I share, I don't see anything. So the problem, it may be better to just start sharing once you're done. When you talk, okay. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, just a short, just a short, short suggestion. I'm, I'm getting multiple requests for uh, for people that would like to see their awards and, and just to let them know that they'll be receiving their awards by email. So if you didn't have a chance to get a picture of your award, uh, I believe uh, they're going to be sent by email uh, shortly after the conference, right? In the case yeah, of that, the yeah, we're sending by email. Yes, yes, we're sending by email like, like this week. Excellent. And uh, in Pittsburgh, we're going to have plaques. That's the that's the plan. Yeah, yeah. I can, while waiting, I can just maybe put up my slide. Um, did we have... I don't have all the paper awards in one. 
but I have the distinguished reviewer seen one and I will share for two more minutes. And then we'll give you control, Judith. Okay, so if you'd like to share, we can uh, can give you a consult, Judith. Daniela, should I already start sharing my slides, or do you want to say something before? Uh, yeah, I do. I do have a small introduction, short introduction, uh, and then you can share, or you want to share now? Maybe, maybe. I can share it now if you want. Let's see, we still have time. Let's try one more time, see if it works. Yeah. One second. Perfect. Okay, now I can basically, I can't mute myself any longer and I don't see you. So you need to give me a sign because I'm now already in, in flight mode and can't see anything. Okay, okay. Well, maybe I can start, Matt, what do you think? Yeah, sure, that's fine with me. Perfect. Okay, so we start. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Judith Simon, who is a professor for ethics in information technology at University of Hamburg, Germany. We're all too familiar with the recent ethical concerns related to, for example, privacy of user data as processed by the systems we design. Too often we hear about massive data breaches of personal information, such as banking information or security, social security numbers of millions of people being compromised. Events that lead to significantly diminished trust in our systems, as well as regulations such as the European GDPR, or the California Consumer Privacy Act that aim to enforce development organizations to comply with data security standards. With the background in philosophy, Professor Simon research, researches approaches ethical, epistemological, and political questions that arise in the context of digital technologies, in particular in regards to big data and AI. In her work, she questions whether trust is a notion related solely to the technology as an artifact itself or to a much more complex social technical relationship between humans and the artifacts in the creation of the technology. She takes us, therefore, to the process of software design and the role of values such as trustworthiness as embedded in the design itself and as determinants of trusting technologies. 
Professor Simon is also a member of the German Ethics Council, as well as serves on various other scientific policy advisory committees. She has also been a member of the Data Ethics Commission of the German federal government in 2018 and 19, and is the author of a 2020 Rutledge Handbook of Trust and Philosophy. In, among other things, she undertook an analysis of a corona worn app in Germany and related issues of trustworthiness. What I'm most excited about in her work, however, is the analysis she's done of large or the larger scale inter-organizational relationships that exist in platform-based ecosystems, where she takes a power sensitive approach as to the value-based design that involves ecosystem players and discusses the influence as well as the limitations that platform providers have in relation to the ecosystem players. With no further ado, you did. I turn back to you uh, to hear all of these details. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dana, for this very kind introduction. It's a bit weird now because I can't see anything apart from my own slides. Um, so I'm starting now and I'll close my slides when I'm done. And if uh, anything is not working, you need to tell me because I don't see anything, as I said, apart from my slides. So the title of my talk is rather straightforward, Ethical Software Accounting for Values in Software Engineering. And my outline is as straightforward as well. Basically, I want to introduce you why we should talk about ethical software to begin with, who's involved, what it is all about, and how can we actually account for ethical software. And then I want to basically draw your attention to two cases, one which with you are probably all quite familiar with, the Compass case um, of a software in the US, and the second case, which Dana just mentioned, the Corona One app, which has been the contact tracing app developed here in Germany. And in the end, I want to draw some conclusions on how to account for values in, in design and what power issues and distributed agency may play in that. But let me start first by asking, why on earth are we actually going to talk about ethical software to begin with? You may think, and that is very frequently argued, that technology is neutral. So isn't, isn't technology neutral? In the end, you may say, well, a hammer is a hammer. You can do all sorts of things with them. The hammer itself can be used for putting a nail into a wall, but also for killing someone. So it seems to be more the use of a technology, but not the technology itself that can be ethically assessed. The question is, would you say the same already for guns, for different type of technologies? Are these still neutral or do they already embed certain values or disvalues? Indeed, the National Rifle Association has actually used a similar slogan for technology neutrality, if you wish, by arguing that guns don't kill people, people kill people, thereby making a remark to say it's not the technology, it's the usage. Other types of technologies you may also want to think about, whether they are neutral and what neutrality may mean in their regards. You may think of military robots, but also, of course, of social software and different types of data analytics used, for instance, by Cambridge Analytica in the US elections or also in the Brexit votes. There is a quote that has been cited quite a lot, which I find really useful, useful in answering the question whether technology is indeed neutral. Melvin Kranzberg, uh, an historian, writes, technology is neither good nor bad. But he also continues, nor is it neutral. Technology's interaction with the social ecology is such that technical developments frequently have environmental, social, and human consequences that go far beyond the immediate purposes of the technical devices and practices themselves. What that basically means is when you design something, this may have an impact way beyond what you can envisage. So what I'm usually telling also my students in computer science where I'm teaching is, when you're designing technology, you're also to a certain extent, and that extent might differ depending on what you're developing, you're also designing society. And what, with this agency and power that you have in designing technology comes responsibility. And the moment we talk about responsibility, we're talking about ethics. So if you want to make this very basic, then ethic really deals with the question of what is good or bad or put differently, what is right or wrong, or if you fo focus on the actor, it asks the question of what we can, should, or must do, or not do, and for what reasons this is the case. Now, if you look from this very fundamental perspective into software engineering, you may want to ask what is good and bad software, and good and bad here both in a technical sense, but also in a moral sense, or put differently again, what can, should, or must we do or not do with software and for what reasons. So good software from that perspective 
basically means that scientifically and technologically good software is necessary, but not sufficient for ethically good software. And sometimes, I can already alert you to that, we may be obliged for ethical reasons not to use specific software, even if it is scientifically and technologically good. When I explain both the history of the role of ethics for information technology or the history also of what used to be called computer ethics, I'm trying to disentangle three different strands of reasoning about what ethics may be in regards to information technologies. The first and the oldest is the ethics of the profession. And that puts the focus basically on all of you, the designers and developers of software technologies. Because similar to basically duties of a profession that medical scholars have or, or medical doctors, the same idea goes that if you endorse and if you are a professional in the field of IT, you also have certain responsibilities um, in regards to the products you're developing. And indeed, as you can see, a number of different associations such as the IEEE, the ACM, but also the German Informatics Society have developed ethical guidelines for their members. And actually, uh, quite interestingly, all of these codes of conduct or ethics guidelines have been pretty much revamped and made and renewed in the last years. The second angle to talk about the ethics in IT is the ethics of use. And that puts the focus of analysis on the users and the usage of technology. So you may think of users in a very different way, in a, in a very broad sense. Of course, this focuses on the individuals. And you may ask questions such as, should individuals be allowed to post racist comments online? Or what should I do about it? Or you may look into companies who also can be users of technology. For what purpose, for instance, can we use customer data? That can also be an ethical question. What are the limits of using customer data? And third, so governments are, of course, users of technology. And the question they may ask is, how should we put, protect citizens' data? And how do we weigh different values or interests? The third line of reasoning about the ethics in IT is the ethics of design. And here, the focus of attention is not on the users or designers, but on the IT artifacts, the technology itself. You can basically distinguish here two tasks. One is the ethical analysis of existing technologies. And the second is the ethical design of new technologies. Let me turn to the first one. Here's a quote from Philip Bray, a computer ethicist from the Netherlands, who writes, computer ethics should not just study the ethical issues in the use of computer technology, but also in the technology itself. He continues, computer systems and software are not morally neutral, and it is possible to identify tendencies in them to promote or demote particular moral values and norms. And of course, this resonates with the introduction in which we are agree may be agreeing that certain types of technologies have in them tendencies to either promote or demote things such as justice or privacy. So if you turn this more constructively and ask not only to analyze existing technologies, you may also think, how can you actually account for values in the design and development of novel technologies? And there's a field labeled values in design or value sensitive design with people such as Batya Friedman or Helen Nissenbaum have been proposing this since the 90s. And here's a quote by the game designer, Mary Flanagan, uh, who writes, if an ideal world is one in which technologies promote not only instrumental values, such as functional efficiency, safety, reliability, and ease of use, but also substantive social, moral, and political values to which societies and their people subscribe, then those who design, design systems have a responsibility to take these latter values as well as the former into considerations as they work. And they propose a methodology which consists of iterative phases of philosophical investigations, empirical and technical investigations, with the idea of trying to inscribe values such as privacy, transparency, or fairness in the design process of novel technologies. So these are the three different roles, or if you wish, lenses or pillars of talking about the role of ethics for IT. What I'm going to argue is that all three of them are necessary and need to be combined. And maybe that they also need to be amended if you look into uh, con contemporary data practices or so also software engineering practices. The picture in the middle is supposed to depict, um, um, give you an idea about basically data brokerages, um, platforms, and commercial digital tracing, tracking, and profiling landscape about all the different actors involved in doing data processing and data brokerage and data, data analysis. This is a picture from Wolfi Christel, which I find quite a uh, good illustration of 
keeping in mind when you're developing systems, especially database systems, you may be interacting with a large number of interrelated actors, which may be diminishing also the way you can do ethics and design, if you wish. But the two cases I want to focus on in the next um, half of this talk are basically uh, the Compass case from the US and the Corona Warn app, the contact tracing app developed in Germany. These are two very different cases and they do not directly have to do with artificial intelligence um, as such or, or with big data processes only to a certain degree. But I thought they are useful in just alerting you to some of the possibilities but also limitations of, uh, of accounting for values in software engineering. Let me start with a compass case, and I'm quite well aware that you should be uh, all very familiar with this case. So what happened is the software ProPublica, just, to give, to, just as a brief reminder, did an investigation in the software called Compass, uh, and they found out that the software used to predict risk, to, to calculate risk scores for reoffense was heavily biased against Afro-American. And there was a big debate between the journalists um, um, analyzing the tools and the developers on methods, if you wish. Basically, they were discussing where this bias came from. In a nutshell, the problem was that the direction of error was different for Afro-American and white Americans. So it was much more likely um, for, for Afro-Americans to get um, to get a, a more negative risk score and, um, and white Americans uh, overproportionately got um, two good risk scores in this system. So even if the average error was similar, the direction of the error was different. Of course, that has a huge impact in such a type of, of tool because if, if it's used to, to predict uh, also to, um, to, to basically decide on probation or bail. Following this analysis of ProPublica, there has been a lot of interest in fairness and bias uh, in these types of systems. So just in a nutshell, to describe what the issue is. So we have a number of ethical issues with software such as Compass. The first is, of course, what I, of course, what I would call the justice problem, because depending on um, where the where what the issues, what the sources of the problem was, is that you find that so societal stereotypes and prejudices, but also existing inequalities and injustices, are frequently inscribed into technologies. Intention is possible, but mostly this is done in unintentionally. Uh, sorry, this is uh, meant to be uh, to read unintentionally through either training data or different methodological choices, which may not be appropriate. Especially data-based um, automated decision-making systems run the risk of cementing the status quo if historical data is used to predict the future and if current contemporary decisions are based upon this historical data. These issues uh, often cannot be assessed and addressed due to a dual transparency problem. So, the first of these problems is what I would call functional opacity, and that concerns a lack of access to proprietary algorithmic systems, which basically means that often, very often, data and algorithms are kept as a property, you know, for comp competitive advantage, but that diminishes the possibility of inspection and control. And here we may need to assess what are the possibilities and limitations of different types of assessment of algorithmic systems. Sometimes you may have to do these ex ante, sometimes ex post, and depending on the system, you may have to have some real-time assessment of certain types of technologies, especially if they are high impact. The second type of opacity is of a very different kind, and this concerns a limited understanding of complex systems, which is not only, but especially the case in cases of deep learning. What makes it even worse is that if you bemoan epistemic opacity, like the limited understanding, it's also the case that the transparency that is needed is user relative and task relative. So what this basically means is if I want to assess a system of whether it's biased, um, I may have to check the system very differently as if I was a user who wants to know why I didn't get a credit. So the type of explanation that I get, and I'm pointing here to explainable AI, or also types of counterfactual explanations, is the type of explanation needed um, is basically dependent on the user and the task. So as I said, as a result, um, in particular of this, of this Compass case, large interest rose, um, and it's also depicted in conferences such as the ACM Conference on Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency, in how to mitigate for these biases and to avoid discrimination in such systems. So what can we, what can we learn from these, from these um, very valuable um, work on, on diminishing bias and trying to counter discrimination in, in these software? 
Well, the first of all is um, that there are different methods to detect and measure and also to prevent and minimize discrimination. And the problem is they cannot be satisfied all at once. So you have to decide which which people or which types of group, which types of even protected groups, you may have to focus on because you can't minimize bias and discrimination to the same extent for all of them. So there are different accounts and measurements also not only of bias detection and discrimination, but also of fairness if you want to counter this. And these measures of fairness require choice and justification. So if just to give you an example, if we are having elections, our, our conception of fairness means we think about each person having one, one vote. So basically, it shouldn't matter if, if you're rich or poor, everybody has one vote. So in this particular context of elections, fairness means each person a vote. However, when we, when we talk about fairness in education or fairness in taxation, people have very different views on what's fair. So that is just meant to, to alert you to the fact that even if we were to implement this technologically, we need to decide on this specific measures of fairness which are appropriate. Also, if you want to mitigate for bias, you need to, dis to distinguish which variables are legitimate grounds for different tre differential treatments and why, right? And again, returning to the question of fairness, should fairness, and in what instance, should it consist of ensuring everyone has an equal probability of obtaining some benefit? Or should we aim instead to minimize the harms for the least advantages? So there are different arguments and these decisions need to be made. So to summarize this, the focus on discrimination prevention in tools such as the one produced by uh, called Compass is necessary, but it's not sufficient for just or ethical software or AI, if you want to be more specific. The focus on methods within machine learning, especially with regards to data preparation, model learning, and post-processing are necessary, but not sufficient for ethical AI or ethical software more generally. Here, political theory and ethics can be sources for reflections on fairness and justice, and they may guide you in finding appropriate methodological choices. However, such choices are always context dependent and the task of deciding on specific fairness measures should not be placed on the shoulders of developers alone, I would argue. And depending on the impact, especially if it's high impact, such as the case for probation and bail, this requires broader public debate and participation. Let me now move to a very different example, the Corona warning. So basically, uh, in, in, in Germany, there was an initial development. So we, we developed a contact tracing app in Germany, and there were different phases. Of course, there are different phases afterwards, but I'm now basing my analysis on the very first months, the first, let's say, six months in which this uh, contact tracing app has been developed in Germany. And if you want to have a bit more detail, I have a reference below in which we analyze the development of this app in a bit more depth. So in summary, if you look at into the development of this app, um, there were basically three phases. In the first phase, there was this idea to do mobile location tracking, and then they switched from this to Bluetooth-based contact tracing. In the second phase, there was a move from a centralized to a decentralized system between different types of, of systems. In the third phase, a number of decisions were made regarding, regarding transparency, security, and the voluntariness of this uh, technology to be used. So let me walk you through these, uh, through these different um, steps. So um, when the pandemic um, basically, you know, came over, all on over us uh, in, in, in spring 2020, there was an initial idea to use movement data from mobile phones to track and find people who had been in contact with infected individuals. And different approaches have been developed all over the world. So initially, some, uh, some countries uh, were, were looking into um, use, using these basically geo, geolocation data. And the technical realization that was envisioned, envisioned in the beginning was that they probably wanted to do this via cell site analysis. Even initially, when this was proposed and when the initial plans were leaked, um, it, there, were, where there were a number of concerns raised by different stakeholders. The first was that location data of people would be processed without their consent. And location data also tends to be rather sensitive because it gives lots of insight in where you are at what time, etc. 
The second type of criticism had less to do with, let's say, ethical issues regarded to consent, but it was related to a lack of precision. So some of the scientists involved in that argued that the data that could be used via this uh, cell site analysis would not be precise enough for this kind of basically contact tracing. And thus we could not justify the massive infringement of fundamental rights for something that is not working enough. So what you can already see here, there is a balancing and an ethical deliberation whether a certain means can be established good enough by a certain a certain end, sorry, can be established well enough by certain means. And if that's not the case, you can't justify this massive infringement of, uh, for instance, uh, privacy. So once this was basically uh, uh, disregarded, um, in Germany, we there was a move towards a second phase. And in that, basically, the in initial idea was to build the Corona Warn app, that was the name for the contact tracing app, on top of the pan-European Privacy Preserving Proximity Tracing Protocol, PAPPT. And here's a quote from the federal government, translated by us, the federal government and the regional states hereby support the architecture of pan-European privacy preserving proximity trace because it pursues a European-wide approach, complies with European and German data protection rules, and only stores epidemiologically relevant contacts of the last three weeks on a user's mobile phone without recording their movement and profile. So basically, this was already a step away um, from, from basically tracking movement, but rather uh, to develop this differently on, uh, on, on, on a Bluetooth basis, where basically it was just about mobile phones being in the proximity, so you didn't know where they were, you only were measuring whether they were close enough to each other uh, during a certain period of time. Um, shortly after that, there was a joint statement on contact tracing apps uh, dated on the 19th of April 2020 with more than 300 international scholars, uh, I think more than 50 or 60 coming also from Germany, who were being critical of, um, of this, um, basically, of this tool. And they made the following arguments, as you can see from this joint statement. Um, they agree that the COVID crisis is unprecedented and that we need some ways of coming out of the current lockdowns. However, they say, we are concerned that some solutions, in quotation marks, to the crisis may, via mission creep, result in systems which would allow unprecedented surveillance of society at large. Um, contact tracing is, well understood, uh, is a well-understood tool to tackle epidemics and has traditionally been done manually. However, manual contact tracing is limited. And for that reason, um, just to continue, in some situations, um, contact tracing apps on people's smartphones may improve the effectiveness of this other, otherwise done manual contact tracing. They continue, these apps would allow the person with whom an infected person has physical contact to be notified, thus enabling them in, to go into quarantine. The apps would work by using Bluetooth or geolocation data. These were the two cases that they have been discussed before, present in smartphones. Through the effect, though the effectiveness of contact tracing apps is controversial, we need to ensure that those um, implemented preserve the privacy of their users thus safeguarding against many other issues, noting that such apps can otherwise be repurposed to enable unwarranted discrimination and surveillance. And just to already alert you that, some of these uh, contact tracing apps have indeed been misused, uh, for instance, to identify people uh, who have taken part in demonstrations, both in the US and I think also in Singapore. But I would need to check exactly where this was, so don't nail me down on this. So research has demonstrated they continue that solutions based on sharing geo geolocation, geolocation data such as GPS to discover contacts lack sufficient accuracy and also carry privacy risks because the GPS data are sent to a centralized location. For this reason, Bluetooth-based solutions for automated contact tracing are strongly preferred than available. So that explains still the move from this more GPS-based to a Bluetooth-based solution. However, when they're proposing, as I said before, this PEP-PT program, there was also uh, an open letter now, this time in Germany, which was signed by a number of um, German, um, both civil society and also academic institutions, such as this, uh, the German Society for Informatics, but also the KS Computer Club, which is, which is a very well-known and important um, hacker community here in Germany, um, but also other types of digital politics um, um, institutions, if you wish. And they wrote, uh, wrote um, um, a letter basically to the German health minister and to uh, the leader of the, of the chancellery 
um, to say that the planned Corona, Corona app is still highly problematic, even if based on Bluetooth. So what happened then is so we have this letter coming from civil society and also academic society being critical of a certain development. And then something else happens exactly around the same point of time at the end of April. And by that time, Apple and Google also announced that on their app stores, they will only allow for de for, uh, for decentralized solution. And the PAP PT was not considered uh, decentralized. Though with that moment, there was a swap. Uh, there was a swap also in the German government to move from the PPT to um, to another approach. Just one second. So basically, in phase three, the first thing that happened is there was a move from this pan-European privacy preserving proximity tracing protocol, PAPPT, to a more decentralized privacy preserving proximity uh, protocol called DP3T. Moreover, there were a number of issues uh, debated to increase the transparency. And for that reason, uh, the two, the two uh, companies in charge with building the software, the Deutsche Telekom and SAP, basically build an open source app. For security reasons, they also ask a, um, an institution, the TÜV Informationstechnik, which is basically a technical service provider that specializes in IT security to examine the app. But also in the open source context, there were lots of checks and lots of feedback on how to improve, improve the app because it was built on open source. Finally, and this has less to do with the technology itself, but with the political and societal context in which it is embedded, there was also a public statement by, the, uh, by politics that the use of the app will be voluntary and that there will neither be any reward for using it nor any disadvantage for not using it, which of course in different countries, different choices has been, have been made in that regard as well. So let me summarize the, some conclusions for this Corona Warn app. So what you can see from this example is that the development of this highly visible software sparked lots of debates about, amongst multiple actors, between politics, tech developers, expert committees, and civil actors, about both scientific issues, but also ethical issues related to contact tracing technologies. The ethical concerns that were raised were with regards to privacy and data protection, but also issues of security, surveillance, but also the utility of the software was highly debated in, and basically in both sides. So the debate, just to let you know, it's something we haven't analyzed in our article. Um, until today, there are massive debates in Germany of and whether this decision was actually right or whether that we shouldn't have other types of technologies that are collecting data in a more centralized way. So the debate is still up, even if the technology has been developed. What is also important to know that we can't really know what made the government change path because really two things happened at the same time. There was a massive uproar in the civil society in the relevant, so in the, let's say in the, in those civil society actors and the expert committees that had that were highly visible and reputable in the context of information technology. So that their open letter happened, but at the same time, also Google and Apple effectively uh, stopped the possibility of developing, I mean, you could still develop a tool that is centralized, but if you can't put it on the, on the app store or on the platform, the, the operating system of most of the, uh, of the mobile phones used in Germany, it becomes useless, right? So what this basically means is that Apple and Google really served as gatekeepers that massively impacted the sovereignty of nation states to decide about technical or infrastructural choice. This may sound very harsh because in that case, actually it has been the price. So basically in that case, they were pushing towards a more privacy friendly um, solution. But even if that's the case, it means if it had been otherwise, right, you may not have had much of a choice either. So, so it's interesting to note that Apple and Google in that occasion um, served as enablers of a privacy um, um, friendly solution, but that need not be the case. At least we should be alerted to the power um, they have via basically providing the operating systems and the app stores uh, um, on, on, their, on their premises. So let me come to my conclusions. I think I'm much faster than I thought. I already promised I'm not going over time, but now I'm going really under time. But I think that gives us more time for discussion. So let me go now to the conclusions. 
I hope I could convince you a little bit that these three basically lenses of looking for ethics in IT are important and that they need to be addressed and complemented for the ethics of the profession, the ethics of use, and also the ethics of the design. Because as you can see from these cases, when these problems occur, or also when solutions are found, basically, you know, you always have um, the responsibility of those developing the technologies to do this as good as they can, right? This doesn't mean that all, all uh, responsibility needs to be placed only on the shoulders of the developers, but they have a special role and power, and this comes with certain responsibilities. Of course, very often ethical issues also come in the use of technologies because, you know, in, in the case of the contact tracing app, basically we were all users or the, the government was on the, on the one hand user, but also the person paying for it. But also take this compass case, right? You have those with the responsibility of developing the technology to be bias free or to be as um, to, to minimize or at least to demonstrate how they were minimizing the risk of discrimination and bias, right? And this was not done because it was neither open source nor it was inspected. And then people are using this without, without knowing or understanding the limits of what they're doing, right? So we need to basically, and then we need to come up with and look into the technology itself. And that is meant by the ethics of design to look into the details of the technology development of the decisions made and the impacts of these decisions, these methodological choices, the data you are using that they have on the results that you're obtaining. So, but what I think uh, the examples which I gave only very briefly also show is that we need to acknowledge what I would call distributed agency and socio-technical ecosystems. Very often, and that's probably very little news to you developing these technologies, is um, you're dependent on so many other actors in the way you can develop technologies. And that may also infringe the possibility of you account to account for values in the design of, of your technologies, right? Uh, and of course, you know, what is of particular, I just, you know, use this in the case from the contact tracing app. Of course, the major internet companies have large powers and th therefore I think also large responsibilities in both enabling, but they can also be diminishing or undermining ethical choices. And I think most, uh, most often it's actually about undermining ethical choices, just try to get rid of uh, data, um, uh, data gathering on these, on these systems. And you know what I'm talking about. But at least, you know, what, what we need to acknowledge is the power that these platforms and also different actors have uh, and the responsibility that comes with it. Finally, the last point that I want to address, because I talked a lot about ethics and there rightly has been also a lot of criticism on ethics uh, recently, and particularly on a very instrumentalized view on ethics uh, in so-called ethics advisory boards or in ethics uh, groups, which basically are sometimes accused of just doing ethics washing to avoid regulation. And I think this is true, right? I think there is uh, also a misuse of the notion of ethics just to avoid hard regulation. But to be frank, I don't think that's the problem of ethics. That's the problem of them, those misusing it. But what it, of course, means, we need to understand these different relations between ethics, law, and polit politics and economics. So, of course, you know, sometimes we need, uh, so ethics is not meant to just be self-regulation, right? So that, that we don't need any law and it's just, you know, codes of conduct. I think this is not going to the right direction. I think we need sometimes have hard regulation to even uh, enable a level playing field for those wanting to develop ethical um, software. But I think we need to understand basically, you know, what are ethical requirements that we have? What are laws that can basically support those? What needs to be discussed also in terms of politics? What do we need to negotiate? And what role does the economic underpinning of software, basically the fact that we all mostly pay with data now and less with, um, with money for many services, uh, how does that impact the possibility of accounting for values in software engineering? And with this, I come to the end already. I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm now closing my slides so that I can see you finally. That's great, thank you. Can you see us now? Not yet, but I hope soon. Um, let me just, that may take a second. Yes, now I can see you. Thank you for such a, a, a provocative talk, uh, Judith. Uh, I think you get the award for uh, the speaker that gives most time for questions and discussions, which is great. We always like that. Um, if you'd like to, uh, whoever wants to uh, ask a question, feel free to use the chat. I do have a couple of questions myself, but 
I'm going to wait a minute or so if anybody wants to, uh, to start so I don't abuse my power here. You gave us um, a lot of questions to think about, Judith. Each one of them could be the thesis, uh, PhD thesis or uh, someone's um, career. Maybe I can ask a question. That's okay. Okay, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, so one of the things that I is so I, I, I collaborate with people in different disciplines. Um, and when I think about the way that we, in the US at least, the way we train um, software engineers through computer science, um, you know, education programs, um, we, we, there's a little bit of ethics, <laughs> but we don't really uh, teach them uh, the language for communicating with uh, what I'll call domain experts in ethics. So when we when we teach people how to how to uh, you know develop um, you know uh, say cyber physical systems or robotic systems, um, you have to teach them how to speak uh, you know the language of uh, you know the hardware developers, the mechatronics folks. Uh, in order to be able to kind of bridge and have a conversation that allows them to appropriately interpret requirements, et cetera, and, so that they can have a framework for understanding how those requirements impact the software. But it seems um, that we are quite far from um, facilitating conversations with what I'll, I'll misuse a term <laughs> or make up a term, you know, domain experts uh, in, in sort of ethical uh, realms. So uh, do, do you know of anywhere on planet Earth that's doing a good job of this? And, and how might we move in that direction? Yeah, actually, um, so I think there is a lot of work that has been done in that direction already. As, as actually, in the U.S., we're quite early in that uh, domain. Also, I mean, if you think of the works of um, people such as um, Helen Nissenbaum or Batya Friedman, who have been working together since the 90s also in educating people at the intersection of computer science philosophy, but also um, science and technology studies to, to learn to talk to each other and to think about how you can basically translate this. I think there's also increasingly a lot of work now done in the Netherlands, also in the UK and some developments in Germany. What you basically need is people really being embedded, I think, in, in different departments. So I have, to, I have to say I'm quite fortunate because um, I'm with my, so I'm, I'm a philosopher in a computer science department. And I think my chair was the first one in Germany to, to do this, to basically, I have all my teaching obligations in, in computer science. So all first year bachelor students have to run through one of my courses. So that's obligatory passage point if you wish. So, um, which basically is, is pretty good because in the first semester they, get to know that we exist as a research group, which sounds a bit strange maybe, but it, it matters, right? If you, if basically everybody in the first term has to go, it's not only my course, it's a joint course with somebody also doing, so we have a joint course with somebody doing human, human computer interaction, uh, business informatics and me. And we have three parts of a lecture that is four hours a week and all students have to go through this. And basically this increases, uh, and, and that's just so valid in the chat, so he was, was a colleague of mine. Um, and, and so basically everyone has to go through this and that helps because it, it raises interest. But the interest is only the first thing because then you need, really need to start, you need to learn to communicate. And it, you know, there's one thing, you know, what we do is, of course I, I tell them about the basics of ethics, right? What, what, is, what is Kantian ethics and what is utilitarianism? That only helps them so far in thinking about what they are going to do in software engineering. So if you want to, at the very end, have something such as, you know, privacy friendly technology or, um, um, you know, avoid discrimination or embed fairness or whatever in your system. These are methodological choices you have to do within your own discipline. So it's not nothing you do in an extra ethics course on the side, but basically for that reason, we're also doing research ethics. So basically trying to walk people through different decisions that they are making in data gathering and data processing and method selection. But we can only do this so far because on the other hand, of course, as a philosopher, I'm also not a domain expert in computer science. So ideally you do this together, right? We do this when we're supervising bachelor or master thesis. And in that case, we often do this with a partner from the technical domain in order to make sure that you know, both is, 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 is uh, taken into consideration. 
But it is it is tricky. Of course, you can always only go that far. But I think it's the right step to do this, to really embed this in these very different ways. On the one hand, to have these overall lectures and seminars on you know societal impact and all these different societal questions, to talk about what it really means in the methodological choices, and that's more the research methods courses. And the third, of course, we also have an ethics committee in um, at the department where basically people need to check uh, if they want, it's not obligatory, whether their research projects are fulfilling um, certain certain demands. Uh, so basically, you know, um, but very often people also talk about um, big issues are there always informed consent um, and data protection and security and privacy, basically. Um, I hope this answered the question sort of. It was a bit lengthy. Apologies for that. No, thanks. It sounds like we, we should have your courses required to all our computer science students at, at all universities. Yeah, now after the pandemic, we have all the stuff recorded anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I would like to start with the questions Ed uh, from its space. Uh, he's very interested in your talk and he discusses about trust. He says, uh, we trust a few large tech companies with or with access to billions of people's data for more than just our accurate location in an entirely centralized fashion. Yet we do not trust our hopefully democratically elected governments with access to their respective population data. His question is, are we then at extreme risk from the very small number of people, a few tens of people that centrally control these companies? We have seen many examples of data abuse. Yeah, I mean, th that is a really tricky issue. And I could talk an hour about trust and trustworthiness, but I'm not, so I'm going to be quick. Um, but basically, I think I'm not sure we're trusting them really. I think sometimes we really have no other choice. So we're, it's not really about trusting them. In, in, in a strict sense, I would say, in a nutshell, in philosophy, you would say you shouldn't trust, right? You should only trust if people are trustworthy. Trust is not good per se. Trust is only good if you're trusting the right person. And of course, we should not trust um, these companies with our data because they haven't proven to be very trustworthy in regards to our data in a nutshell. And people, depending on diff in, in different countries, people are more or less skeptical towards data processing of either companies or the state. So there are much more reservations, for instance, uh, in, uh, you know, I'm, I'm of course making this a bit now black and white, right? Apologize for that. But in Germany, there's a lot of, you know, there's also a lot of criticism towards, um, you know, I mean, given our history, the state having data or surveillance measures over, over, um, uh, over the population is something we're very critical of, right? So, um, so for that reason, I think it's right um, to, to be critical. I think we should be critical in both cases, both when it comes to the companies, and I think uh, we need to really have, so I'm a defender to be very open about this, but very hard regulation about data markets and online advertisement, right? If it was me, that wouldn't exist. So I'm being very strong on that. Um, on the other hand, um, and I think we also have to place higher standards on on governments if they are using data, if they're using software, right? Because also in the, at least in the German case, in the law, um, the state is much more bound to respecting our fundamental rights, right? The, the state is not allowed to discriminate, whereas companies can do this to a certain degree. So of course, the software that is used by the state must also fulfill higher standards. So in a nutshell, I think we shouldn't trust we shouldn't trust un unless we have an indication that people are trustworthy, both in the case of the states and also companies. Yeah, so you touched on um, the role of regulation and interplay with power. That was the second question. Should we be using regulation to break up these tech companies to make them accountable, controllable, and in some cases smaller than the governments that are supposed to regulate them? I mean, th this is a major issue and I'm, you know, I'm not a, you know, this, this is, this is basically also a question for somebody doing antitrust law, right? And, you know, I'm, I don't feel super competent in, in stating what are the right measures of, of countering that power. I would agree though, um, that the way it is right now, we, th there is an imbalance in, in the amount of power um, that, that, that different stakeholders have. And the moment, I mean, you know, if you just, just think about Elon Musk buying Twitter, right? Um, and that just gives you an indication of, of um, I mean, not that Twitter used to be not a private company before that, right? But it just shows you that the more money you have, the more you can also circumvent. And the important thing I think is social software is by now 
a, a public infrastructure, right? Most of our informational uh, uh, public information happens on these platforms, right? And if you have so much power, that's what I was trying to argue, you have a lot of responsibility, but sometimes it feels as if these companies want all the power that, but they don't want the responsibility that comes with this, with being a, being a provider of basic infrastructure. And I think this is a problem, right? Be, previously, at least in Germany, um, also in other countries, the state has been the main provider of basic infrastructure, but with that came responsibility for making sure it works, right? But if you if you don't want to take the responsibility, then maybe there shouldn't be so much power in the place in the hands of single actors. I hope this somehow answered, even if I wasn't entirely clear on what it means by, by splitting them up. Well, you speak about the role of the different agencies in this complex ecosystem. Uh, I'd like to go to jump to Paul Ralph's question for, for, for a change. He talks about, uh, you know, ACM and IEEE um, as, you know, prattling on about ethics. But he's, he asks about the pressure that we could put on academic institutions themselves to act more ethically. What's your, your opinion on that? So you mean, you mean pressure on, on academic institutions to, to develop, um, to account for ethics in the way they are doing research or... Possibly, and, and how data is being handled? Yeah, I mean, so a major issue basically, I'm not sure this is, if, if this doesn't go, go into this in the right direction, let me know. But um, what we have been debating in, in Germany recently is that um, university institutions are to a certain extent complicit in data gathering practices over researchers when they are buying into um, publication suits uh, from LCV and Springer, etc. So basically, there's a lot of tracking and profiling happening. And the, uh, the universities can also track now the reading and download and other practices. And not only those, but they're, they're sort of like, the moment you, oh, how should I put this? So there's a lot of pervasive data tracking happening and the universities buy in this. And so one of the questions was, shouldn't there be a joint emphasis uh, or a joint action of all the um, academic institutions to counter this, to basically prohibit that this type of data gathering and is, is happening because you're already paying quite a lot of money, too much money, way too much money for the publications to begin with. We shouldn't also be tracked, you know, either you have a business model based on free services and tracking or you pay for something, but you shouldn't do both. So that would be an occasion where you need to do some joint initiative. Um, that's one thing. If it comes about the research itself, right, you always have to strike a balance between freedom of research and uh, and infringing on this freedom of research, and that's a balance we're always striking. Also, when we're doing ethics assessment in our in our um, department, so what we're doing is usually we're trying to give people um, 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 help, right, in how to improve their design of their research process to mitigate some of the harms, to maybe have the same results with being less data pervasive. So that would probably be something uh, something to go towards. Thank you. That's great. If, if Paul thinks uh, we need more clarification, perhaps you can ask another question, Paul. Um, I'd like to take us to Bashar's um, note, who wants to challenge the software engineering community itself. He says, could it be that we need to rethink the discipline of software engineering itself so that it considers its outputs just as much about the lived experience itself as it is about the hardware and the software behavior? Probably, I think um, I think the understanding of, of engineering has already shifted a number of times, right? I mean, you know, and again, correct me, I'm not an engineer and I'm not a computer scientist, so anything I, th I say may be wrong. But I mean, you know, usability was also something that was not considered very important for a long time, right? Uh, or the, the pleasantness of, 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 of software, if you, if you wish, right? Um, so that there was a shift in this becoming a major, a major impact or a ma major point of attention. So similarly, you, you may want to think about, you know, accounting for values as something that, that software will be judged more against in the future. And I think given that, um, Ethic, uh, actually, there is a lot of regulation already in place that demands that certain, um, not only values, but also rights need to be accounted for in software. I'm pretty sure that this will play a higher role, right? I mean, if in the law you have requirements not to discriminate, of course, once you delegate this process to software, then you may need to make sure that the software is not, not, not discriminating. So I think this will have an impact. And of course, 
I think, you know, I mean, also these, the user studies, right? I mean, trying to, to look into, there, there has been a development in value-sensitive design to not only look at the direct users of technology, but also the people impacted by technology afterwards, right? All of these shifts have been happening in the last decades. And I think it's moving into that direction. That would be my take. That's right. Truly speaking about the value-based design and how this could be integrated into technology. Um, Huang Chi Gao asks about uh, fairness, uh, which uh, you know you mentioned there's different views of fairness and how complex those are. Are you pessimistic that people will eventually come up with a unified definition of fairness? Um, in what direction should one optimize fairness in software? Yeah, I'm not only pessimistic about it, I just think it wouldn't make sense, right? So it's not that I think it would be a good idea to have a unified account of fairness. I just think in principle, this cannot exist, right? Um, because as I tried to argue is um, really what we mean by fairness um, differs between contexts and between different people. Um, and there is actually, I think, no need to once and all settle it for once. If this were settled for once, that could only be done through domination, right? And, and by just you know thinking, I don't, I don't care about the context. I think it, this doesn't work. There are reasons why we culturally have, and these are shifting and also changing over time. You know, and there may be sometimes, um, um, and of course th there can be debates and we can disagree about what fairness is. And then sometimes we may have to find a political compromise on what we think is the type of fairness in a given context that we think is most acceptable, right? And then we have to come, but of course, it's not only about agreeing about dominance, but also about providing reasons why you think in a certain context, specific notions of fairness are appropriate. I tried to give the example of elections, right? Where we have an underlying understanding of fairness that you don't get 10 votes because you're earning more, but only still one vote. That is an implicit conception of fairness, right? But of course, this is very different for taxation. And we, again, have very implicit understandings and differing understandings of what a just taxation system should look like. And I think there is not only, uh, I'm not only pessimistic, I think um, the idea of a unified account of fairness is misleading and dangerous. So I think you just answered one of the questions I had. Is there ever unbiased software? No, maybe just no. in certain contexts. And that's no, I more think... complex than we think. Yeah, sorry, now I interrupted you, no, Dana. No, it's okay. Um, no, I think I think there can't be bias-free software, right? So what you can strive for, I think, is to mitigate bias to the highest degree for the most severely affected populations, right? Think about, you know, if, if you develop a database system in order to predict, as we had before, right? I mean, likelihood of reoffense, um, um, likelihood of paying back a credit, uh, predicting who's the best candidate for a certain job. In all these cases, you want to make sure that you don't systematically have uh, doing differently well for men and women, for people of different or people of different genders, or people of different races, or different skin colors, or different religions. Right? You want to make sure that at least, at least those um, th those groups that are defined in the constitution that should be protect protected are not discriminated against. But even that is tricky because you need to basically check that none of them is being discriminated at once. And sometimes you may have to de decide which it has historic, I mean, that would be my hunch. In a given context, you may, have, uh, you, you may have people who have been historically most disadvantaged. So if you were to optimize, I think your optimization um, should go towards making those best off, right? So, but that is a choice, right? People may disagree, but I think if you can't optimize to the same extent for all groups, then you need to find, give a reason on why you're selecting one or favoring one for the other, right? So optimizing, minimizing harm for everyone, but maybe focusing on those most disadvantaged would be a good rule of thumb. Yeah. Uh, Ed also has a question that makes me think that what I learned is that fair software is really um, the notion is, is a social construct and open for public debate, as you put it. Uh, and he's asking whether openness of an organization is a necessary requirement to ensure ethical behavior of that organization. So is it, is, is it the ability to scrutinize and, and, and debate uh, whether that organization provides ethical behavior in its software? It increases the likelihood of people behaving ethically if they can 
if things can be inspected that i would that i would agree and i think there should be a requirement for let's say and it can be also a bit a bit more provocative in that regard but i think if you have high impact high risk technology that is either mandatory or used by a state it should be open source um, because it gives other players and stakeholders the possibility of inspecting it right um, and i think this is crucial and this sometimes, of course, you know, there are lots of debates to what extent openness um, increases or undermines security, right? Because you may make it open to attack. On the other hand, what usually happens is people also find bugs. At least that happened with the Corona Van app that since it was open source and it was such a high, visible, uh, a high visibility uh, technology, lots of people were reporting on issues that were happening there. So my take would be, yes, it is important to have some, some scrutiny and some oversight. But maybe we shouldn't also, yeah, I think we need to be carefully very investigate what we mean by openness and transparency. It will never mean that everybody understands everything, but it, that's why I was drawing attention to these different types of assessment, right? Um, sometimes we may have to have ex ante controls, basically sorts of, you know, checking whether something is compliant before it can go online, but for very high risk, right? For others, we may just, you know, in case somebody complains, we need to have ex, ex post investigations. Um, so it really depends on what type of openness, what type of explanation and transparency you need in which context. Great. Uh, there's a, a question from uh, Zane Lee. Uh, he says that in his experience, smaller resource constrained organizations um, deal with privacy and it can be uh, dealing with privacy in those organizations can be more challenging as compared to larger counterparts. We, we focused a lot on the big platforms, mm -hmm. particularly yeah. with just in time requirements. How can the three approaches to ethics be applied for these smaller organizations? Yeah, I mean, it, it is, it, it may be tricky on the other hand, you know, and, and that is the easy way and I'm not trying to take the easy way out, but, but basically one is, I mean, the same legal requirements face smaller and larger companies. So I think even if you are a smaller company, you need to have one person who at least un understands what the, what the, even the legal requirements are, right? I mean, for data protection and, and, and these types of things, I think there's basically no way beyond this, even if you're small. One practical way would be basically to team up with other companies which are smaller, right? I mean, that that's that could be one way of, of going, basically, that that you you have people that that also have some competencies and competencies and capabilities in dealing with these issues um, um, and exchange with others. Um, I think that would be would be important. I don't think you can delegate it. Uh, th th there is no way of, of doing this. And I think you need to build up, the, build up these expertise and the competencies in-house, even if you're small. I, I know this place is more burden, right? Because you have less people. But honestly, I think there's no way of, of circumventing it. Because if you have the, if you are developing tech, you're the one in charge and responsible to, to know that it's done in an appropriate way. But teaming up with others and, and may, may be a good solution. Only in Victoria, on Vancouver Island, I know a few startups who went out of business because they could not become compliant to GDPR in 2018 when it when it, when it was enforced. So that was a big hit to the smaller companies, uh, organizations. Um, there's no more questions, so perhaps, oh, oh sorry, there are. Um, Martin Glintz is asking, when developing software for a rather specific purpose, developers can be expected to consider ethics of use and ethics of design. But how about general purpose software, for example, a database system or a data analysis package where all sorts of use are possible? Isn't that kind of software rather equivalent to the metaphor of the hammer? Yeah, good, good question. Very good question. I, I have to say that's something that, that has been uh, keeping me busy in my mind for a while because I'm also in the dual use committee uh, of, of um, well, of the main German research funder to, to think about, you know, what are possible dual use scenarios and what what about general purpose technology right i mean you know if you if you do facial recognition tech or if you do any type of pattern recognition can it also be misused very easily and what are the implications that um that you may may do so there's no easy answer to that right but i think what i tried to argue before is that there is of course distributed agency and if you develop something that is general purpose then you need to do this general purpose technology as good as you can with the highest standards that you can do to develop this and whoever then is using that technology 
has his own responsibility of using it in an appropriate way, right? The, the more generic something is, the less you can't foresee future misuse. Um, nonetheless, even if you, you know, what, what I'm always advising also my students is to think about potential misuse when you're developing something and to think about what would happen if your system was all of a sudden, you know, thinking, talking also about small startups before, would it matter if your system was all of a sudden adopted by a million users or a million users, like a billion users? Would this cause problems? And can I somehow mitigate these possible problems in advance by certain design decisions? Um, that doesn't solve any of the issues, but it's probably a, some, some guidance in thinking about these issues. Uh, Paul Ralph continues, uh, he says, fairness is a great example of an essentially contested concept. People don't agree on what's fair and they probably never will, you might get an abstract definition that most people could argue, agree on, on, but as soon as you start applying it to specific circumstances, people aren't going to agree. So that debate can, can go on, as you say, and it's very contextual. Um, we have uh, a comment, the software engineering community leverages uh, platforms such as GitHub, Stack Overflow, and so on. How can we, at least as researchers, do so due to ethically use all the data, tools, frameworks, code, and artifacts there? Can you repeat the last part of the question? How can we researchers? Yeah. Um, I think he, meant, he, he means how, what can we do as researchers to ethically use all the data, tools, frameworks, code, and artifacts on these platforms, GitHub and Stack Overflow? That's a hard one for me, right? Because it, but, but basically, I mean, the question: if if you're if you're using already existing technologies, the, the I mean, the first the first question is: so what? what some of the earliest debates have been about uh, about research ethics online have been, but the data is already out there on Facebook, and you know, if you do some scroll, uh, some some web crawling, um, um, can can't we use it? That's not so much about about these tools, right? But it's more about the data. And then at least you need to think about whether somebody gave consent or whether somebody has, has agreed to re, you re, reappropriating certain, certain data. So that's a tricky part, not, not so much about um, stuff being on, on, on GitHub, but rather um, on data, on, on web scraping, if you wish. Um, if you use tools that, that, that are placed online for, for reuse and you're using them in an appropriate and responsible way, um, thinking about the potential impact this may have, depending on how you employ it, I think you're already doing your, you know, doing a right step in in, in reasonable uh, usage. So I think I think the first most important step is always like, is it okay to use what is there, or are you impacting somebody's rights by using, e.g., the data? Um, and then if you are reappropriating it, uh, what may be the flaws that are embedded in the system, and how can this impact future use? I'm not sure how helpful this is. It was not super precise, but um, yeah. I think that's an important question we should we should keep talking about because we have so much use of that data on these platforms. I'd like to end with one more question uh, from Walid Malej uh, from, your, from the same university in Germany. Uh, he talks about, you know, not, not only value-based design is difficult, but he talks about automation. Um, he says, um, we like to design libraries and processes to achieve automation. There is now much automation in usability testing to, 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 to link to your example. Do you think automation for designing values and for test, testing ethical aspects are achievable and to what extent? Yeah, certainly can, the, the um, extent, namely when you already know what the context and the setup is and if you've already decided upon, let's say, a certain, let's say, fairness metrics for a given context, right? If that is done, if that deliberation on what is the right fairness metric in a given context, then I would assume that certain types of automation or maybe even formalization or standardization, even maybe just standardization before automation would already be helpful, right? So I think there is this deliberation phase in which you think how exactly what does fairness or privacy or whatever mean in which context? But once this decision is made, for instance, in the context of, of fairness, you may have certain standards or sets or steps that can go towards automation in, in ensuring this, right? The same could be done for, let's say, GDPR compliance, right? If you have certain requirements and you can automate and check that these are accounted for, and there's lots of research going in that direction, basically verifying that you're a compliant. Uh, uh, so that could be, I think, to that regard, there can be automation. But to keep in mind that 
the moment that values are context and task specific and also community specific, um, there will never be full automation, I would say. Yeah, so maybe we can um, coin the term value-based testing or ethically-based testing if we sh <laughs> With this, I would like to thank you very much, Judith, on behalf of everybody. The questions kept coming, which says that uh, you have given us so many insights to consider. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the afternoon in Germany. Uh, in the in-person conference, perhaps we can consider having a birds of a feather to continue, continue that discussion for those interested. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me and have a great conference for the rest of the time. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. And good luck with the rest of your day. Yes, on heading to the parliament. <laughs> yes. right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Matt. I think the platform will close or I'm just going to leave. You're still there, Sebastian? Matt? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. It went well? I think yeah, I think it went really well. I thought it was very, very good. It was a good, a good keynote. Tons of questions, tons of thoughts. So yeah. Uh, so far, two for two. You guys are doing great. I just realized we don't have a BOF right now planned, Matt, for this. We were going That's to. Good. You can have yeah, one. Yeah, but is she, the question is whether you're going to have someone yeah. there that can lead it. That's right. Yeah, because she's not coming. Uh, she did give us some questions. Just so you know, we're still live. Oh, are we? Fine. Okay. <laughs> well, we do have questions. You know, we want to transfer. It's good. <laughs> Everyone yeah. can be behind the scenes. Well, it's it's so good that we didn't say anything anything bad. But anyway, very positive. <laughs> Yeah, it was good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move into our customer support booth now, Matt, I guess. And <laughs> All right. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so see you later. I think it went well overnight. I don't think I it think went well. well. Yeah, yeah. Great discussion. Yeah. Okay. See you soon. Bye. Bye.